Well, when I was 59, we went to see Sai Baba for the first time. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, I am really quite surprised that I'm actually 99 and on the way to, to be 100. But I suppose uh, as long as Baba wants to use me as his instrument, it's okay with me. No, uh, I really didn't think about how long I was going to live. Um, it was a little frightening uh, that my mother lived to be 107. Have you learned all the spiritual lessons now? I'm quite sure I haven't. But he says that this is a wonderful time to be born and to live, and uh, that he will help us to to work out our past karma, and uh, he won't push us beyond our endurance. Sometimes I say to him, you're almost there. You've almost pushed me beyond my endurance. <laughs> just back off a little bit. And I'd been taught from infancy that, that I was, you know, not very competent. And so I didn't have any ego. In fact, it was the reverse. I had, you know, I was without any belief in my own ability. So I knew that if, if, I, had to, if I was going to do something, he had to tell me what to do. Yes. You're going to put a party to the home of Sri Satya Sai Baba again. You're planning for your next trip. I don't have any idea how many trips you have made. Well, I, d I never counted. Uh, I never counted how many trips we made. I never thought to count how many interviews we had or, or anything. I mean, it's not, that's not the point. It's what he's teaching. Uh, that's all that matters. And so then, as usual, because I was in the back with not saying a word and hiding, Mrs. Crystal, say I'm God. And I said, oh, God, but I can't. Mrs. Crystal, say I'm God. So finally, just to stop it all and get it over with, I said, I'm God. <laughs> louder, Mrs. Crystal. So I said it a little louder. Louder, Mrs. Crystal, till I was absolutely shouting it. And that's how he deals with each one of us. A video interview that is sheer delight and of profound importance. Holy man Sri Satya Sai Baba's longtime devotee, Phyllis Crystal, at 99 years old, a font of wisdom, love, and equanimity. Among all of Sojourn's interviews with this globally known author and educator, this one is perhaps her most important. Finally, she says Baba is allowing her to talk about her love for Sai Baba at the very same time that she talks about her decades-long work of helping others. Welcome to Soul Journeys. Uh, now, I'm a newsman, Phyllis, so the historian in me would say Phyllis is a 99-year-old beautiful woman. But the news guy in me would say Phyllis is almost 100. That's so, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go with that. Thanks, over, May. Over your almost 100 years, yes. Phyllis, if we could begin this way, I would find it wonderful. <laughs> where are you? Well, it you, has its disadvantages. <laughs> where, are you, where are you right now in your understanding of self? And I'm talking about this small s as well as the big s. Well, uh, that's a good question uh, because as you know, I've um, been used to develop this method that um, I teach. And uh, because I've been using it, I've changed tremendously. I used to be so shy that even to think of, of talking to a lot of people or doing uh, an interview like this would have terrified me. But uh, I think uh, Sai Baba was responsible for getting me away from my shyness. And now I, I'm getting used to it. <laughs> and hardly, hardly shy, hardly dependent, hardly needing of anyone else's uh, physical, let alone moral, support. You just stepped off an airplane from Zurich, Switzerland, yes. close to where you live now, traveling at 99 by yourself. Oh, yes. Do you think the day will ever come when you will no longer travel alone? I don't know. <laughs> uh, sometimes I travel alone, uh, but sometimes I travel with someone. It, but mostly alone. Mm -hmm. Is it correct? Everybody has a, 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 is meeting me with a wheelchair, and I have a wheelchair to take me to the plane. So I don't, it, and I it, never feel alone. Might it be appropriate mm -hmm. to call you fearless, since fear is one of the hallmarks of which you 
rail against an individual is to find out who their real self is, which takes them beyond fear. Are you now fearless? Um, I used to say I'm only afraid of a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> and now I've even lost that fear with my, <laughs> with my dentist. <laughs> well, you said that unprompted, and I would consider this a Leela. Let me explain to the people, because no more than five minutes ago, I casually overheard you telling a story off-camera to Jody about a dentist <laughs> and Sai Baba. An amazing story. And I was going to ask you, where is Sai Baba in your life today? And this story is probably as good as any to begin with. I guess it is, and I'm sure he's dictating what we should be doing today, because I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it on my own. I have to see what he puts into my head, uh, because I've said yes to him, which means I'm his instrument, and uh, so he has to direct the session as he directs all my seminars and teaching programs. So what about the story when you were to see your dentist and mm -hmm. somebody else showed up? Tell us about that story. <laughs> well, I had been, uh, since I moved to, um, to uh, Zumicon, which is near Zurich, I had been looking for a dentist and I had found uh, two or three, but they wanted to take all my teeth out or they wanted to do uh, in, uh, root implants. implants. And uh, I, I said, no, I can't do that because I'm traveling and I'm teaching and I can't be without teeth, you know, that long. So I just was not very successful. And then um, a friend of mine recommended me to a physiotherapist who came to work uh, on me for a while. And uh, one time he was there, he was telling me about his new dentist. And I said, well, that's very interesting. I've been looking for a dentist. And he said, but this one is very, very unusual. He's not only a dentist, a uh, qualified dentist, but he's also a homeopathic doctor, and he also practices uh, Chinese medicine and uh, uses acupuncture. And I said, well, I've been looking for a dentist, a homeopathic doctor, <laughs> and a Chinese uh, doctor. So here's all, all of you, all of them in one body. So I said, I said to this young man, I'm going to take you to my office and I want you to call him up immediately and make an appointment as early as possible. So that's how I got to this, uh, this uh, delightful doctor. And uh, the, first time, the first day I went, I wanted him to check my teeth because um, uh, I know that the whole balance of your body relies on, on your teeth. So um, he was checking. And all of a sudden he stopped and I could see he was kind of wondering what was going on in his head. And he said, do you, do you happen to know uh, Satya uh, Sai Baba? He's asking you if you know Sai Baba. Asking me. And I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> Here was a completely unknown dentist asking me if I knew Sai Baba. And I said, yes, but how do you know about him? And he said, well, uh, one of his lady friends had been a devotee, and so he knew who he was. But he said, the reason I'm asking you is that Bob is sitting here right now. In well, the physical again, form. Again, I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> and, you know, I always like to have Bob confirm that I'm doing the right thing, because, you know, he, he directs you to, to the people that you want. And what more could, have I, could I have asked? than to have him sitting there talking to my dentist while my dentist was working on my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so the dentist is looking at Sai Baba. He's not a Sai Baba devotee. No. But he recognizes his he form. He recognized him because his, one of his girlfriends had uh, been a devotee and gone to the ashram. But it's, yeah. it's not a static photo, it's Baba in the form. No, you know? it was, no, he'd only seen his photo. Uh -huh. But he's, but Baba's was, there with him. He was there, and he's always there when I go. <laughs> <laughs> so what more could I have had of a recommendation? Well, what do you make of this? What does this mean? I don't know, you better ask so uh, Baba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it, uh, I started asking about how fearless might Phyllis Crystal be, and I did that for two reasons. Isn't because that funny? Because that's one thing I'm. Uh, you know, I think it's the only thing I'm really terrified. Oh, maybe I'm terrified of being bedridden mm -hmm. before I die. You know, and having to depend upon a lot of other people. Yeah, yeah. But, but not very many fears. 
Well, we, we know what you're doing for your 99th year. It's no easy chore for anybody at any Oh, but age. I don't know what I'm doing for my 99th year. <laughs> <laughs> you just had a nice lunch with us today, so we know a little bit about what you've done. Well, I know the immediate scenario yeah. or the immediate program, but I try not to look into the future. It would scare the daylights out of me. If you made one exception, if you made one tiny exception, what would you like to do in less than a year to celebrate your 100th birthday? Well, I've had one suggestion uh, in England that it would mean a big birthday bash with a very good friend of mine who has a birthday the same day. Really? And we celebrated our, ni our 90th. But it was all the celebrities and a big, big thing. And I don't think that my family would be very happy. Yeah. Uh, she wants everybody to come over and celebrate. Yeah. So. I prefer a very quiet one. Yeah. I don't like a lot of, uh, of uh, hoopla. You know, uh, Jody and I have been, we counted it up now, I thought it was 15 to 16 times we've been over to Puttaparthi to India. No small trip for us under the best of occasions because it's such an arduous trip. Yes. Uh, in the old days for us it was 36 hours in transit. Uh, and when you get to be not feeling good every day, that complicates matters. Yes. You're going. To Puttaparthi to the home of Sri Satya Sai Baba again. You're planning for your next trip. I don't have any idea how many trips you have made. Well, I, d I never counted. Uh, I never counted how many trips we made. I never thought to count how many, how many interviews we had, or or anything. I mean, it's not that's not the point. It's what he's teaching. Uh, that's all that matters. And are you practicing his teachings? That's what he really wanted. And specifically for the people not who are collecting, you know, like collecting scalps, uh, <laughs> uh, or uh, you know, just a collection. No. Mm -hmm. Uh. Uh. Well, this is a two-lane highway because it's not only it's about what he teaches, but it's about what he's taught you to teach to others. That's true. So talk then a little I have bit to about practice that. practice before I have the right to teach. Yeah. So you had to get the lessons down right yes. to become his teacher. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and he was so patient. Oh my, he was so patient. Because I was so shy and uh, I, I never wanted to speak uh, to, to, to any, you know, to a group of people. You spoke to thousands over there. Well, I, I remember one time, um, it was when, uh, I think it was when my first book was printed mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, in uh, England. And uh, my husband and I were away for the weekend. And apparently it was on the, on the stands, you know, the newsstands. And uh, we were looking around and we saw that my book was, was now out. And then we saw one man coming around and kind of looking at us and then going away and coming and looking at us. And uh, he finally came up to speak to us and he said, do you happen to be Phyllis Crystal? And I said, yes, how on earth did you know? And then he, he, he said he just read my book. What was the, the title first of that book? One, the Cutting the Ties That Bind. Cutting the Ties That oh. Bind. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, um, I hope you don't mind my asking you, but would you be willing to give a seminar with my group? I'm a, I'm a psychologist, and I thought, oh my God. And uh, we're all psychologists, but we would love to have you do a seminar. And so I said, well, I'll think about it. And then I thought afterwards, what on earth have I got myself into now? I've never given a seminar. And so a group of therapists who always know better than anybody <laughs> else, you know, and uh, here I'm doing a very different kind of uh, method than, than they are. Uh, how, how am I going to manage that? But I thought, well, I, I, you know, I'd better take a chance and say yes. So then shortly afterwards we went to India. And we were invited in almost immediately for an interview. And Barbara said, Mrs. Crystal, why are you so worried? And I said, well, because I'm very, very afraid. I've been asked to give the first seminar on my work, and I am terrified to talk to a lot of people. And he looks at me, and he said, but many people, let's think, let's look at it. It's one plus one plus one plus one, all are one. Mm -hmm. So just concentrate on one. 
and besides, I will, I will help you. Mm. So we left India and went straight to London and then up to Malvern. And here was this group of therapists and I had no idea what I was going to do. I'd never given a seminar before. I'd only worked individually with people. So I opened my mouth and out came the words and they flowed and they flowed and they flowed. And at the very end of it, I realized I'd done the seminar. And it, I kept thinking, oh well, this is just one time. It will never happen again. So the next time I was asked to do a seminar, I thought grudgingly, well maybe he'll help me again. And each time, yes, it was just the same way. When I knew I couldn't do it, then he could teach me. It's when you think you can do it, he won't interfere. Mm -hmm. But if you really say, I can't do it, then he's very willing to, to teach. That's dive, like diving off a cliff <laughs> without knowing for sure if you can swim. What, eh? That's like diving off a cliff without knowing oh, for yes. sure that you can swim. Absolutely. And exactly. you do it. And you've told me this many, many times yes. without a trace of ego uh -huh. ever, which is the telling point to me. Mm -hmm. And I know other people who do very effective talks. I'm thinking of a good friend of, of ours, uh, Dr. G. Venkatraman. I've seen his meticulous notes. He puts hours, if not days, into preparing for his lectures. And he's currently in this country speaking 31 times with 31 lectures. Yeah. Well, it must take months to prepare, and you tell Horrible. us that it just happens. <laughs> I it's never, trust. never, never prepare. Never. And, and you've been traveling the world, Eastern Bloc countries, everywhere, everywhere. Uh, since I've known you. Oh, yes. Uh, giving these lectures that attract many people. Part of why we're here today in Edison, New Jersey, is to talk about that, which we'll get to in a minute. And I, I advise people who are new to you, who are seeing you for the first time, and including Sai Baba devotees who are familiar with your work but have never done it before, mm -hmm. to be sure to look up the guides, the video guides that will lead them to the seminars and webinars and books that help them learn mm -hmm. what Baba has taught you. If they're willing to, to read the books, but nobody wants to read anymore. Well, it's you, amazing. But, but you had to do some sort of work to become a, a good student of Sai Baba and he, it sounds like he corrected you along the way when he, uh, when he found you maybe not grasping all the lessons exactly the way he meant it to be grasped. Well, it wasn't so much that way. It was that I knew I couldn't do it myself. It was impossible. I'd been taught from infancy that, that I was, you know, not very competent. And so I didn't have any ego. In fact, it was the reverse. I had, you know, I was without any belief in my own ability, so I knew that if, if, I, had to, if I was going to do something, he had to tell me what to do. I want to ask you a private question about mm -hmm. learning. <clears throat> when I was 47, I remember thinking to myself, this is a wonderful new spiritual path I've discovered. Boy, I wonder if the day will come when, say, I'm 67, that maybe I will learn all I need to learn. <laughs> Well, that was a joke. <laughs> I didn't laugh then, but I've laughed ever yes. since. Uh -huh. I, I actually wake up now at 67 realizing, how am I ever going to accomplish the new questions and the understanding that's, that mm -hmm. comes with them? What about you? When you were 47 or 57, 59, and did you ever think at 89 or 79 or 99 you might one day know it all? Well, when I was 59, we went to see Sai Baba for the first time. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I really didn't think about how long I was going to live. Um, it was a little frightening uh, that my mother lived to be 107 and uh, I hoped I wouldn't have to live that long because I, I could see that most of the older people were not very happy and not, uh, not independent and I did not want to be dependent upon a lot of people. But I never really thought about it other than that. Mm -hmm. But now I am really quite surprised that I'm actually 99 and on the way to, to be 100. But I suppose uh, as long as Baba wants to use me as his instrument, it's okay with me. But he says that this is a wonderful time to be born and to live and uh, that he will help us to, to work out our past karma. And, uh, 
he won't push us beyond our endurance. Sometimes I say to him, you're almost there. You've almost pushed me beyond my endurance. <laughs> Just back off a little bit. And, then and of course he listens to you. And then also I say to him, if you want to use me as your instrument, please fix the instrument. Very he good. hasn't done that because I'm sure I'm still working out some old negative karma. Okay, you've done everything but answer my question. Oh. <laughs> and my question <laughs> that is very that often at, happens. at 99, have you learned all the spiritual lessons now? I'm quite sure I haven't. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, what, pray tell, what age do you think one must become before they learn them all? I think sometimes there, people are very young. Uh, I know that when my younger daughter was killed in an auto accident mm -hmm. and I went to see Swami, uh, he said she achieved everything in this life. During the last five years she got everything she needed. Mm -hmm. And so Maybe not what she wanted, she but was, what she needed. No, what she needed. She, well, she, uh, she had a, a husband, a house, uh, she had a little girl baby uh, who was three and a half when she, when she died. She had a, a, a son, only eight months when she died. Mm. But that was what she wanted. She wanted to be a mom like yeah, me. Yeah. She had a career, uh, just as I do, but that was her dream. And she did. She had everything she'd ever wanted. And she apparently had finished it. And, and that's what he told me when I went back after she died. It's often said uh, among journalists who report on uh, calamities in our personal lives that there's nothing that equals the loss of a child. Yeah. Um, over the years and the decades, have you been able to process that horrific loss? Well, I think that we're here to learn what we haven't learned in prior lives and we have no idea what that is. And I think we're working out a lot from our past lives, a lot of the mistakes. Uh, and I never, I did not believe in karma or reincarnation, uh, but I learned uh, by being regressed into past lives a long time ago, when I didn't believe it, uh, that I wanted to, to be like Edgar Cayce and be able to diagnose physical problems because I'd always wanted to be a doctor and instead of that I learned um, I, I really experienced the ex the, um, the things that, that I had had to go, to go through in several of my lives mm -hmm. and I don't recommend it I don't think it's necessary mm -hmm. but I think it was necessary for me because it's made my life a lot more meaningful so you pretty much just answered the, my next question are all these terrible experiences that life sometimes throws in front of us, mm -hmm. learning exercises for us to gain a higher position mm -hmm. in our spiritual awareness mm -hmm. of self. Because this is a school and we're learning what we didn't learn before. And it's very simple when you look at it that way. I'm a little confused. You told me earlier that the only reason anybody would go to Puttaparthi would be there to be with Baba to learn his lessons. And yet, his Maha Samadhi happened now nearly three years ago. Mm -hmm. You're returning again. You've been there since his passing. What do you learn? What is there to learn? I'm asking this semi-facetiously. What is there to learn at Puttaparthi, at the abode of highest peace, peace Prashanti Nilayam, in Baba's physical absence? I don't think there's anything that you can learn from a place. Uh, he. Uh, you can, you can uh, be re-energized because his energy is still there, but he doesn't want you to be attached to a form. He doesn't want us to be attached to his form in the orange robe. He wants you to find his counterpart in your own heart. And at the end of our first, uh, my, my husband and I, uh, the end of our first visit, uh, he, in those days, it was January of 1973, at uh, Whitefield, uh, he, ha he asked, he was, he was giving what he called farewell interviews. And so he invited my husband and me for a farewell interview. And I was very, very uh, anxious to know uh, what we did now. You know, here we were, we had, we had come to see him. Now, did we come again? Or what, what, you know, how should we proceed? I needed to know, you know. There had to be a reason why we were there and what, 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 what we were supposed to do about it. And I'll never forget it. 
he pointed his finger at me and he often wagged his finger <laughs> and he said first remember you do not need to come back and see this little body and he pointed to himself and he let that let let me think about that and I was uh, I was understanding that because of the method that I'd been being taught uh, about 20 25 years before I knew he existed and then there was a pause and then he said find your find your counterpart in your in, find my counterpart in your own heart and then with a smile he said you will be back to be re-energized mm -hmm. and now even when he's not there in physical form it you do feel still feel the energy but you don't have to go back you don't need to because he's everywhere. So you can be literally anywhere. Yes, and he's much more available to us now when we think that we can only make contact with him in the in the uh, in the ashram. And you know, this is maybe the third or fourth time I've had a chance to interview you. At least three previous times around the world. And I forgive me for asking one or two questions a second time, but um, in a world where we're not supposed to judge, I'm judging this the most illuminating interview uh, I've ever had with the Psy devotee and I, I want to seize on it for the benefit of those who are watching this for the first time watching Sai Baba devotee stories or stories about Phyllis uh -huh. Crystal and my question is this many Thank people you, ask Jay. me all That's the time mm -hmm. many people ask me all the time how they can stay in not just constant contact with Swami but even once a year feel like they've reached him with their concerns. Mm -hmm. And you know that answer better than anybody I know. Well, I once, very early in our uh, journeys to Sai Baba, I asked him, I, I, got, I got up my courage to ask questions, and I said, are you going to give me a mantra? Because I understood that most of the spiritual teachers gave a mantra for, to their uh, chalas, and I thought, he would, I thought he would do the same. And he said, no, for you, no mantra. And I was sort of disappointed. And he said, this is what I want you to do. So hum with your breath. So and hum. And it means I and thou. And in that way, you will become more and more connected to your, your God self. He always called it God self when he was talking to me. And so... So is on the intake, the inhale? In the intake you say so. And he, he, he sang it. And it was beautiful. So I tried, I thought he wanted me to sing it. So I tried to, to imitate. And he said, no, not out loud, in your head. Ah. Just listen to it. And then he, he, he uh, sang it again. And that's what he gave me to do. And hums so on the exhale. That's what I started to do. And now I, I know that if I'm giving a talk or a seminar, I can't do it myself. So I just say, okay, I'm your instrument. Now you talk through me. And the words just come. I never prepare. It just flows. Just as I told you, you know, at the, um, uh, at the first uh, yeah, seminar exactly. I ever gave. Yeah, I followed you all through New York City for the seminars there in the Flushing Meadows and uh, Unity Meadow Church Road. on Park Avenue yes. and down in the Bowery. You, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I was so impressed then with such a simple solution to overcoming one's fear to allow their com inner confidence to produce the message or the confidence that you need to carry on in life. I'd be scared to death to do what you're suggesting. Well, I was, would have been terrified before if ever anybody asked me to, you know, to, to give a toast at a party. Yeah. I would reluctantly get up and then I'd burst into tears and sit down. <laughs> so, it's very familiar. knowing I can't do it myself, I just wait and see. I trust him. So the answer you're giving word. me to my question when people ask, they think I know these answers because I talk to so many people. Uh, certainly not because I know them myself. I'm still learning too. But the question is, you and you, you gave a great answer with so hum, directly from Baba's uh -huh. lips to you. Uh -huh. When a person says, Phyllis, I've tried over and over to reach Swami in my thoughts and in my prayers and in my words, but I, if he's there and if he hears my concerns, if I ask for direction, 
somehow I don't seem to be able to pick up on what he's, what his answer is. Well, I'll tell you what he said to a group of us. Uh, my husband was the vice president of the organization, and it just so happened that we were in the, the ashram at the same time to, with, with many other officers of the organization, and we did not plan it to be that way. And so they all decided they would have a, a meeting, and they had a problem in the organization. One of the members was causing a lot of problems by being much too controlling. So they were all, we were all sitting around. Now all of the, all of the, peop all of the officers were men, so uh, the wives were allowed to be there if they didn't say a word. So we wives all sort of sat in the background listening. And Barbara would come in every now and then and sit and listen. And one time he came in and sat for a while. And, and while it was all going on, I was listening, I kept thinking to myself, I wonder if there would be a method, a, a way, to know whether it's the high sea or Barbara, you know, uh, coming through, but what, what he wants, or whether it's somebody else's uh, uh, feeling that, uh, what, what, what they expect to happen, mm -hmm. or if it's my own will. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if Barbara perhaps could, could tell us what, how to dif differentiate so that we're sure it's our high C or our Barbara self. High C meaning higher consciousness. <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, he, uh, he was able to read people's minds. I'd had experience with that. So he was reading my mind, and in the middle of all this discussion, he leaned forward, he was quite a, way, a long way away from me, and he almost shouted, Mrs. Crystal, you have, uh, you have a question, or you have something to say. I said, oh no, Barbara, we wives are not allowed to speak. <laughs> and then he grew himself up, and he had the wonderful ability to appear as if he was a giant. It was extraordinary. He was so imperious, and he said, Swami is telling you to speak, so speak. <laughs> and so I explained what was going on, and he looked around with a smug smile, and he said, you see, that's a very good question, which made me want to sink into the ground. <laughs> and then he gave the most wonderful advice. He said, if you have a problem, or you need guidance, just take one of my photographs, go to a very quiet place all by yourself, and then look at the, the, the photograph and ask me what you should do or what is the answer to your question. And you will get the answer within 20 minutes. But I've noticed that, yes, he sends the answer in 20 minutes, but you don't always get it. You mm -hmm. get it at the right time. Yeah. So I've been teaching it and also trying to apply that ever since. But be confident that the answer does come. Yes and keep your eyes peeled for its appearance in your life. Uh -huh. So that sounds like that 20 minute rule can bend a little bit on either side. It, um, might, it might be a few days before you get the answer or longer. It can be several months, it mm -hmm. can be several years. Uh, because you see, in Baba's level on his energy, there's no time. So uh, it doesn't exist and so we, we, of course, do gauge it by time, and so we, we get impatient, but he doesn't, because he knows it will be at the right time. Well, I'm always impatient, and yet just a minute ago, listening to you speak, I was thinking of the next question to ask you, uh, and I don't normally do that, I just listen mostly, and then talk about what you, picking up on what you said, mm -hmm. and as if uh, by magic, the answer came to me, and. I'll repeat both because they have to do specifically with Jody and I when we had a conversation with you over lunch this, this afternoon. The question that came to my mind was to ask Phyllis whether or not she's concerned at all after Baba's Mahasamadhi that as the years go by there could possibly be fewer people interested in his being here, in his lessons, mm -hmm. in his mission, mm -hmm. and then almost as soon as I completed it, the word indigo children came into my mind, oh. which was exactly what you were sharing with us over lunch today. So yes. do you want to address them separately, or do you want to address the first question uh, with the answer of the second? Point? Well, I think mostly 
people uh, miss his presence because they really don't know what he, they don't really think about what he's come to teach. So they would go to him wanting something that they wanted and expecting him to answer their questions the way other people would try to answer them. And they don't, they don't, I don't think a lot of people realize uh, what he once said. I have come to give you what you asked me to give you, hoping that at some point you would be willing to ask what I have come to give you. So that's what he stresses. Ask him what he knows you need, because he's much wiser than any of us, and he knows what's good for us. We don't. We think we do, but we don't. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I've heard you say that five times before, and oh, yes, each time it hits me like a ton of bricks. Well, you see, it has to get the subconscious part of your mind, and that means that you have to repeat it over and over and over, because the subconscious part of your mind is much more childlike, or like a dog or a cat that you're training, or not a cat, but a horse or a child that you're, that you're training, you have, to, you have to give the same command or the same suggestion and repeat it. Please turn off the lights or please close the front door when you come in. You have to keep going because they don't get it the first time and it's the same with the subconscious. You must see many of us uh, spiritual seekers, Sai Baba devotees, students of books like A Course in Miracles and all sorts of uh, people mm -hmm. who proclaim to be on a path. What do you see that's one of our biggest mistakes that we commit a lot? Well, Baba always says that everyone is on an inner journey, and it's from the self with a small s to the self with a big s. So it's from your limited um, physical self to your high self, or your Baba self, or God self. Because Baba says yes, he says he's God, but he always says, finish the, uh, finish the sentence. Uh, he also says, yes, I say I'm God, but so are all of you. And this is something that we don't, we, we can't even accept. I know I couldn't. At one interview a long time ago, uh, there were several people, several of us, and he came dancing into the room. In those days, he seemed to float. And he looked around at us all, and he said, oh, none of you knows who you really are. And we all looked at one another and thought, well, we thought we did. You know, we knew our names. And he said, no, you don't realize you're all God. And that was very hard for us to accept. So then, as usual, because I was in the back, with not saying a word and hiding, Mrs. Crystal, say I'm God. And I said, oh, Baba, I can't. Mrs. Crystal, say I'm God. And he kept it up. I kept saying, I can't. I was brought up in the Church of England, and if I dared to say I was God, I'd Heresy. be beaten. So finally, just to stop it all and get it over with, I said, I'm God. Louder, Mrs. Crystal. So I said it a little louder. Louder, Mrs. Crystal, till I was absolutely shouting it. And that's how he deals with each one of us. Mm -hmm. He keeps on telling us the same old thing until we get the point. This is hugely illuminating. <laughs> um, my skin just vibrates because I sense the significance of this sitting between us, the three of us here in this yes. room with Jody. And this I'm, is right here. You yeah. see, we think of him at the ashram. Yeah. That's ridiculous because he's everywhere. Well, he's within each one of the three of us. The so soldiers he's in, our, in our midst. All started be, by him, because of him, for, for the benefit of anybody who can say to themselves, there might be other people around the world who have had greater experiences. What profit it would bring to me if I listened to their stories. And so it's such a great pleasure to be able to share these stories. But what I've found, and I want you to be aware of this, is that sojourns with, you've been with us since the very beginning, and it's now reaching many people who have never heard of Sai Baba and who don't proclaim to be followers of Sai Baba. They'll come to watch some other interview, and they'll happen to see a lot of other interviews 
about this holy man Sai Baba who's unfamiliar to them. Can you talk a little bit about people who are not Sai Baba devotees, who are trying to forward themselves towards discovery of the higher self, what they might do yes, to best serve them? Yes, because when this works, with this method, cutting the ties that bind, first started to, to be revealed with uh, a friend of mine, Virginia and I, and uh, I didn't know it, Baba existed in human form, so I couldn't possibly appeal to Baba. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about it. I've never heard about him until a good 25 years later. But now I realize that I always think now of Baba as my high C or my, my higher consciousness. That's what was, who was teaching me the whole method. So it was really Baba teaching me the whole method. So that's why now I understand why the first time we ever went to see him in January of 73, um, he, uh, we were all sitting in Whitefield on either side of the wonderful pathway with trees on either side, which was the way it was in those days. He would go to the men's side and then kind of float over to the ladies' side and then the men's side and then the ladies' side. And when he came to the ladies' side near where I was sitting, he went beyond me. And I thought quickly, oh, he's not my master. Because I always knew that the master ch chooses the disciple, not the other way around. And with that, he turned around with an enormous, wonderful smile, like the sun coming up, and s said to me, so, long pause, you have come. And I thought, well, of course I'm here. Another long pause. At last! <laughs> and what went through my mind was, how could we have come here any sooner? Mm -hmm. We only had read a book about him in October of the year before. And here it was only January. With my husband's work and my working with my method, we couldn't get away any sooner. Why did he say that? But now I'm realizing that he, as the God force within me, was teaching me all these many years before I knew he was in a form. So I was very fortunate. I never got connected, you know, to his form. I always, uh, I always was aware of the God within me. So it's very easy for me. And he knew this. And that was another reason why he could give the work to me. And dare I say that it's not even important today, even after his passing of his physical form, for oh, people yes. be, to become attracted, to be, for people who feel they need to become devotees of Sai Baba, and for, for whatever reason that might be something that they don't care to do. I would guess you would say that's perfectly all right. Mm -hmm. That you don't have to be a follower no, of Baba you don't. to profit from no. what he brought for people to He once to learn. said, uh, in my presence, I like to repeat things that he said that I heard, mm -hmm. then I know that they're true. And he once said, um, oh, where was I going? Um, no, I've lost my train of thought. Not needing to be a devotee. Uh, I was asking. Oh, about. yes, I know. Um, don't just practice, uh, uh, don't just read my, about my teachings, don't just listen to my discourses, the most important thing is to practice them. Mm -hmm. And that's what we don't seem to be able to understand. We listen to them, we say, isn't that wonderful? We read a, one of the, the discourses in a book, and we think, isn't that marvelous? But then we don't put them into practice. And another time he said, if you take one of my teachings, just one, and practice it every day, that would take you to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. wow. And the other thing he said that would take us to enlightenment, that was the only spiritual teaching he gave to us, not singing bhajans, not doing japa mala, nothing it would be better than putting the Sealing on Desires program into practice because he said the only thing that gets in between us and being one with our IC or our Father Self is our desires. So he started us off with very baby steps and he gave me a long interview on it all alone, which was rather unusual. And he went through each of the categories, mm -hmm. money, food, time and energy. And he said if you take baby steps and stop wasting 
money, time, uh, money, food, mm. time, and energy. It will get you into the habit of of getting rid of your desires, getting um, and because you will be stopping the extravagance and the waste in the world. So he gave us this program as the only spiritual exercise he ever gave us. And he had uh, sent out little booklets for his 60th birthday. Uh, I think it was the 60th, uh, yes. And um, we had to, to follow this program and then uh, give the savings that we, that we had collected from cutting out waste to the poor or people who were needy. So at the, at the celebration of his birthday, we all went back there and he gave a discourse the very first day and he was so angry. Mm. Uh, he pretended, he, he used to say, he's never really angry, he pretends, he puts on a very good act. And he was very angry because many people had sent money to him in, because you see, he said it, you would save money and you'd give it to a saver. Mm -hmm. But they sent it to him and he said, I'm sending it all back. I don't need your money. I need your, your uh, practicing the, the message. You've missed the point. You haven't put this program to, into practice in your everyday life. And that one program is the only spiritual one he's given us. So. It, is, it was a very unpopular one. Um, I wrote several articles for the various magazines, and finally I wrote a book, a little booklet, and then I developed it into a bigger booklet from all of Barbara's teachings. And but it's been very unpopular. People do not want to give up their desires. Boy, this is also important. And as we draw to a close on this interview, and this interview is a prelude to an interview that I've been requested to do by people very dear to you about your work, which we'll do oh, next. Yes. But before that, the, my, maybe a fitting final question is, <clears throat> there's an indicator that I'm aware of right now about how Phyllis continues to grow spiritually that has to do with your involvement with Sai Baba and your separate but also important work that you've done since before you came to know Sai Baba. Oh, yes. And you've always meticulously kept the two separate. Very. People would call you and ask <coughs> you to speak and you would give them a choice. Should yes. I speak about my work or do you yes. prefer me to speak about my As attachment? you know from yes. the interviews you give But that's now changed and somewhere in your Completely. 99 years. I'm, I'm astonished. Just now it's changed. So this is yes. as good a note as any to end on mm -hmm. because it'll lead into the next series of interviews, it, it and that is, how did this change come about where you're now granted Baba's permission to talk about both? Well, when I, when he was first talking to me about the method and telling me it had to reach as many people in the world as possible, which astonished me, I couldn't think how I was ever going to do that, but that's what he was telling me. Um, let's see where I go from there. Um, he also said, keep the two separate. Mm -hmm. His message, even though it was the same as the, as the work I'd been receiving, keep them separate because people are not yet able to understand and it would confuse them. So I was not to, to give it in the centers and I didn't want to because I did not want control. You see, the whole, the whole method is based on people not controlling other people or allowing other people to control us. <laughs> Great concept. And there were many rules and regulations connected to the organization. Sure. So I didn't want it in the centers, but a lot of people mistakenly told, said that I wanted it, I did want it, but that was not the truth. So I meticulously kept them separate. If people, when I was doing a seminar on my work, and somebody asked if I would talk about Sai Baba, I said yes, privately. And when I was talking about Sai Baba, I, and they asked about my work, I said the same thing. I kept them separate. And then at the, um, at the teaching, uh, I think it was, I forget when, it was a youth conference. Uh, he, uh, I was one of the speakers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first speech, I gave. He was not there in person. He had a lot of politicians, 
but he could hear me speaking over the over the, the um, public address system. The system. Mm -hmm. And so he sent a message to me that the next day I should give another speech with him present. And of course I was wondering what on earth am I going to say? Because the, the theme was youth, messengers of size love. And I'd given a speech along those lines and I thought, what more can I say about that subject? So I went, when, when I was ready to be the speaker, I went up for his blessing and he took my hand in his which was wonderful because I'd, I'd, I'd always thought to myself, I'd always uh, asked him, you know, not personally, but please take my hand and please lead me. And so he reached out and took my hand and, and stayed that way for quite a long time while he talked to me and said, I will help you. And so I went up to the microphone and I thought, what on earth am I going to say this time? I've already talked, told them <laughs> that they'd got to have something to share with people if they were messengers. You take something, you know, to share with people if you're going to be a messenger. And so I said, you know, what we have to share is Swami's love. And then I find I found myself taking the whole group, all of the thousands of people, including all the youth who were there for the youth conference, through a part of my work, which I call the Maypole exercise, which is, is breathing in Bosphorus love and then sharing it with other people in the mm -hmm. world. And I kept looking at him, he was right beside back of me, <laughs> looking as much as to say, you know, is this what you really want? You had me keep them two separately, and here you're, I, you're coming through. Yes! Yes, and I, and I thought, all right, this, this is what you want, I'll go, I'll go for it. And so I took them all through it, and it was unbelievable. I looked at, out at them all, mm -hmm. thousands of people, and here I was, the shyest person in the world, being willing, with Barbara watching, to give a talk to all these thousands of people, and they were all crying. <laughs> and I thought, my goodness, this is exactly what we wa he wanted. But I didn't do the maple. I said, here is Baba in, in, in person. Think of a ribbon connecting your heart to Baba's heart, and then breathe in his love. And he was enjoying the whole thing. <laughs> so again, I felt so reassured. I would never have dared to do it without him telling well, me. And you've given that lecture all over the world without his physical presence, and here you were with oh, yes. his physical presence. Here, I was, here he was. <laughs> I've been doing the maple, which connects people to the barber within, but here he was. So, of course, it was easy. Your, between your heart and his, because one time we were in an interview, and he told me to do something. I don't remember at all what it was. But I remember saying, oh, Baba, the organization would never let me get away with that. And he got so angry again. And he said, your loyalty is not to the organization. It's heart to heart with Swami. Just like that. So he'd given me my marching orders. Phyllis, we have less than a minute. I'm going to severely test you real briefly. What is it that Baba wants you to tell us as you say goodbye to us? Um, just to practice the maple, breathe in Baba's unconditional love, and you can only get it from the Baba within or your own high sea, and then radiate it to everyone you meet. And if you slip up and forget to do that or radiate something that's negative, start all over again from that point forward, I would guess. If don't waste time in guilt. It's a horrible waste of time. Set it right. Start doing it. Don't don't, don't waste time. Charles, we love you. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is always so much fun. And Thank so you for inviting hugely me. Hugely important in our lives. Thank you. Sairam. Okay. Sairam. <laughs>